Greetings, Sim Captains, and welcome to Flight Brothers FT. We often say, plan the flight and fly the plan. And today's topic is exactly that, commercial airline flight planning. Where are we going? How will we get there? What aircraft are we going to be flying? What information will we need to program and operate that aircraft? As X-Plane has become more realistic and the other simulators, it's become almost necessary to operate them in an entirely real-world manner to even be able to function the aircraft. As a result, uh, you can use the internet quite easily to mimic the operations of actual airlines and they'll do a lot of the work for you. So, let's go to flightaware.com. From flightaware, you can actually find most of the information you would need to operate your own aircraft, but there's going to be some information that you can't get directly from it. On flightaware, the menu in the top left, Live Flight Tracking, has a variety of ways you can interact with their information, but for today we're going to focus on two that are the ways I tend to prefer to search for a flight. Uh, first, browsing by operator or airline if you choose to think of it, but they've listed it as operator. If you search by operator, you're going to get this list. And you'll notice at the top the airline that has the most flights currently in the air being tracked on FlightAware with American Airlines at 443 active flights. We could click American Airlines and those flights would generate on the screen and we could peruse them. Um, one of the issues with that being if you are flying for example the Zebo 737-800 you don't really want to scroll through the entire inventory of American Airlines just to cherry pick some 737-800 flights. With 443 flights in the air, that's a lot of sorting for you to do. So let's go back to the FlightAware homepage. Another way to search in that same live flight tracking menu is um, to browse by aircraft type. When you browse by aircraft type, you will get a list of all the aircraft currently in the air and the number of each. Uh, at the very least, you should look at this because it's quite entertaining, um, particularly at the bottom of the list where you find single models of an aircraft flying. Occasionally, you'll find some very exotic aircraft down there that are being tracked. But up at the top, you can see today, uh, at the moment I screenshotted this, we have 1,188 Boeing 737 Model 800s, the same as the Zebo mod. You'll notice the code for the Boeing 737-800 is B738. Uh, that might be relevant in some of our other things as those code numbers pop up. It's just an abbreviation for the 737-800 makes it fit in the smaller space. So, um, while we're referring to that, there are other codes for it, such as B73H. If you're wondering where they came up with H, H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. So it's basically equivalent to having the eight there. When you click on one of those aircraft models, you will get a page of all of the current active flights of that model. At the moment, uh, it's not evident to me what this list is sorted by, but each category there, ident would be your um, operator codes. 
type is not going to be relevant because we're already in a parsed down list by type. You could sort it by origin. I believe it would go uh, alphabetical. You could click it again to have reverse alphabetical. Destination, the same there. Oh, departure has the arrow. We are probably sorted by departure time at the moment. Uh, even though the times may look a little screwy, they don't appear to be chronological. It's because the time zones, uh, if it was all listed in Zulu, I suspect they would look very neatly in order. There's estimated time of arrival. But the last one on this list is the one I tend to use, the estimated time en route. Most people, when they're simming, have a certain amount of time they anticipate spending in the sim. You can expect to need about half an hour to plan your flight, uh, load the sim, and get the plane started. I think half an hour is a pretty conservative estimate, quite honestly. Sometimes it takes longer to select a flight. So if you click that estimated time en route, the first thing you're going to get is a descending order list from the longest flights to the shortest. Again, it's actually quite fascinating to look at. Uh, you'll notice the first one, two, three, four, about six flights here have no estimated time. Since there's not an estimated time, you would have to click on this flight to really see how long it actually is. Um, some of these are longer than others. You can just kind of eyeball some of them and guess on the times. We've got a Ryanair flight here that's probably not terribly far but we have some things from uh, South America up into Canada. Those are going to be a little bit longer. But let's look at the ones that actually do have a time listed. We have here a 7 hour and 15 minute flight, um, THY, that's Turkish, and they're going from Istanbul to Zanzibar. Uh, you really, if you're going to take your Zebo or whatever simulated 738 you own, and fly at 7 hours and 15 minutes, you're going to want to do some serious planning. Um, Turkish is flying near the limits of the aircraft's actual performance range, and you are going to need to very carefully plan your weights and your speeds and check the weather, because running out of fuel in uh, the 738 at that kind of distance is a very real possibility. So assuming that you're not planning to spend seven hours flying a 737, um, let's keep on moving. Let's click that again. The little arrow by estimated time en route will invert the list to the shortest flights. And now you can see we have the list sorted with the shortest flights. We have a uh, QFA that's Qantas up there from Melbourne to Canberra, only 27 minutes. Um, I probably wouldn't do that flight because honestly I'm going to spend more time planning it than flying it. At 27 minutes, it's basically a hop. You're hardly even going to need to pressurize the aircraft at that point. You are really spending very little time. Uh, that's sort of a, a quirk that a flight like that even is necessary, but you can look through some of those there. They're interesting, you know, like here we have uh, some Japanese airlines, high density routes where it just, it makes sense to move that many people a relatively short distance. So scrolling down, I think you're going to find most flights in the one to three, four hour range is really what's a sensible, normal flight range for the 737 Model 800. I'm not going to scroll and show you that segment, but you can use the next button yourself to select a flight. I'm going to use a, another option here to find a flight, and this is actually one that I think is uh, the most fun, if not the most practical, and that is the map search. So going back to searching by model type, uh, this is the beginning of the 737-800 search, and you can see that map of the world at the top. If we enlarge that map, we can see every active 737-800 currently being tracked, and the green dots represent the origin and destination airports. Sometimes it's just fun to hover over one of these aircraft and see where it's going. You can see high, high up here in the, uh, in the Arctic of Siberia, and it looks like we might have two 737s possibly heading for the same 
or one might just have a relatively polar route headed for Europe perhaps but that might be an interesting flight just because we're headed into the far north and that's kind of interesting or perhaps we want to go out here to Hawaii so you can always click a flight this way just to keep things simple for the moment I've zoomed in on the continental United States and in about the middle I've hovered over United Airlines and you can see flight information's popped up it says UAL 788 that's United Airlines flight 788 B738 means it's a Boeing 737-800 uh, 37000 means we're at 37,000 feet, that's the flight level. We've got a speed, which i got to be honest, my screenshot's a little blurry, it looks like 587 to me. And then we have an origin, SNA, and an arrival of ORD. And uh, that might be the arrival time, that's certainly not an estimated distance, 1959 must be the arrival time. If I click on that aircraft rather than hovering it, it's going to bring up the flight information. So here's the flight information for United 788. You can see right under that title uh, the two codes for it, UAL 788 or UA 788. And then we've got some departure times, arrival times by time zone. On the left, we see we're departing from SNA, Santa Ana, California. And on the right, we're going to arrive at ORD, which is uh, in Chicago. It's the code for Chicago O'Hare International. We're going to need that information to plan our flight today, but we will need ICAO codes. Those are IATA codes. They are three letters. That's what you see when you're a passenger on your luggage tags. But all of the flight planning will be done with the four letter ICAO codes. Fortunately, conveniently, in the continental United States, um, all you need to do is add the letter K, K S N A, and K O R D. But I do want to show you how you would figure that out if you were not in the continental United States or if something else strange happened. You could jump over to Google, type in SNA space ICAO for ICAO. We did that for you, and here's the screenshot. The result was John Wayne Airport. And you can see at the end on the right hand side here, it says IATA, IATA, SNA. That's the code we already have. ICAO, ICAO, KSNA. Like I said, continental US, you're just going to add a K. But those are the codes we will need to actually put in when we're planning our flight. Let's jump back to that flight information page and scroll down. Below the map you can see we have a progress. At the bottom we have an activity log showing previous flights that operate under that same flight number. And you'll notice the equipment even switches sometimes. It's an Airbus 320. Uh, Looks like this flight is mostly bouncing back and forth between SNA and Chicago O'Hare, but we do also have Newark and Reagan National in uh, the capital of the United States. On the right hand side is the more important information for us for flight planning. You can see our aircraft type. We already know we're Boeing 737-800. Scrolling down right above the stock images, this is probably the most important item for us. We have the actual route being flown. You can see the first one is stay one with an extra Y. That is the standard instrument departure, the SID. And we have Avery, Lancy. Those are uh, GPS waypoints. They're five letter codes. They're meant to be pronounceable. They're always phonetic. We have J96, that is an airway on the map. Uh, there's a number of points along it. By, in, by inputting J96, the computer on our aircraft will connect from Lancy all the points in J96 until DRK, which is a VOR. Three letter codes are a ground-based radio beacon called a VOR. TBE is the next VOR. GCK, the next VOR. IRK, the next VOR. Then you can see Shane 1. 
which is a star, a standard arrival into Chicago O'Hare. Alright, so now that we've kind of identified the information we need, we want to think about how we are getting there. Now we've already landed on a 737-800 because that's how I chose to search today. But you will need to give some consideration to selecting an aircraft that makes sense. Uh, and a lot of that is going to be based on range. This chart from Wikipedia shows on the bottom the range in nautical miles, the maximum range. And the maximum range of the aircraft does require some fuel consumption measures at times like reducing the weight, flying at higher altitude, and flying slower. If you're not planning to do all of those things, you can expect to not achieve the maximum range of the aircraft. Let's find our 737 Model 800. You'll notice it's actually in the far left, just above 3,000 nautical miles. If you go up two red squares, you'll see 737 800. This is not an extremely long range aircraft. If you, for example, wanted to fly from Los Angeles out to Australia, this is not an appropriate aircraft to select. You would want to move to the right hand side of this chart and select an aircraft that actually has the range to make its way out there. Likewise, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to do one of those 25 minute flights we saw earlier using one of these aircraft from the far right unless you had a very intelligent reason. For example, a 747-400 cargo model might be doing a very short flight because it was necessary. So range is something to consider. If you are mimicking a real world flight, they've already considered the range for you. Uh, but again, we'll want to be careful with those extremes like that Turkish Airways of the longest operating 737 flight in the air at the moment. The next thing, if you are just considering the flights on your own and not mimicking the real world, it might not hurt to look at the charts to consider if your aircraft makes sense. Here's a small airport near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You can see it only has one runway, not a whole lot on the ground, a few taxiways, but it is 8,222 feet long. This runway is acceptably long to handle a pretty decent sized aircraft. Even the largest of aircraft could successfully operate on that range depending on the weather conditions. But basically speaking, we have the runway length that is necessary. If you find a smaller airport like this, this is a very small airstrip in Chandler, Arizona, which I've selected because it is the first airport I ever operated an aircraft out of, and it is only 4,416 feet long. Uh, it would be ludicrous to load up a 747 and try and depart from this airport. Could we make it happen in the sim? Possibly. Might the wings hit obstacles as you try and depart? quite possible. So again, just things to consider. But if you do follow the wor real world airlines, it won't be a big deal. They have already selected appropriate aircraft for the appropriate airports. So, if you've selected real world flights from FlightAware, you've found the origin and destination codes, you've taken a peek at the route and you know what equipment they're using and you plan to use that equipment, this is the website you're going to want to use, simbrief.com. Simbrief is free, it is remarkable, and basically mimics the actual paperwork that the dispatch office of an airline would hand to the flight crew for their flight. On the top menu, we're going to go to Dispatch and down to Dispatch System. At that point, you will need to log in. Again, it is free. If you don't sign up for this, I, I have no idea why you would not. Once you've logged in, you're going to want to 
click Create New Flight. At this point, there's a menu that could look a little overwhelming, but there's very few things you actually have to put in here. In the top strip for flight info, you should put in an airline, but it won't hurt if you don't. You should put in a flight number, but it won't hurt if you don't. You must put in your departure or your origin airport with the four letter ICAO code we identified earlier. You must put in an arrival with the four letter ICAO we identified earlier. The alternate will be selected for you. As soon as you finish putting in your arrival, it will populate. The times are largely irrelevant, but it may affect the weather reporting on the briefing. The aircraft type, there's a drop down menu and most of the standard airline models you would ever want to operate will be in here, but do be sure you select the correct model number. For example, a briefing for a 737 model 700 is going to have different fuel calculations than for a 737 model 900, so that must be correct. The advanced aircraft options you can leave alone. The other optional entries you can leave alone, but it is fun to put your name and the captain's name to see it come up in the forms. Lower down, oh, sorry. Before we go down to the bottom, let me show you how I typically tend to input this. If you put your flight aware flight information page on one side of your screen and this one on the right, you can easily populate all the information. Our airline code is UAL for United. Our flight number is 788. Our departure ICAO is KSNA. Our arrival is KORD. The alternate populated automatically. The aircraft type is B738. And down at the bottom, I put in Flight Brothers FT. Now we can scroll down further. After you've input that much, the route will automatically populate Pig and 2, Avery, Lancy, J78, DRK, J96, IRK, Benke 5. You might recall that is not the routing I read to you earlier from the actual flight. If you look on the far right for suggested routes, it says click to use very often you can find the actual routing used by the airline. I believe I see it down here as number five, although I haven't memorized exactly what it was, but it was a stay one departure. I remember the uh, J96. I don't think they used Benke 5. Regardless, uh, one of the reasons we might be getting this, the arrivals are attached to runways and it's possible that from the time that actual real-world flight departed with its filed plan to the time I started playing with this the winds may have changed and the arriving runway may have changed which would affect the star used to connect to that runway regardless if you really want to use the exact one they did you can also blank this out in the route and copy and paste it from the other one. Down here where it says your route is valid for Act 1903 and the route distance, the uh, air information cycles, ARACs, are numbered and X-Plane does come with one. If your FMC says nav data out of date, it is past a month old and will automatically put up that. If you are using an older air rack, you can go into the FMC, find the air rack cycle number, which will be four numbers, click this air rack options and select that older um, air rack cycle. That will give you accurate flight information for your sim to line up with the briefing. Next. Once you save your flight up at the top, you're going to click Generate um, OFP, and that will take you to your actual flight summary and briefing information. So here's the top of the page. You can see 
the most important information is up there, including our routing. By the way, if you look at the routing now, Pygmy 2, Avery, DCT. DCT is not a VOR. Uh, if you attempt to put in DCT, you will get an error on the FMC. DCT stands for direct, meaning we are flying directly from Avery to Lancy. You will basically ignore this DCT marking. Next, below that, we have a map, and you have a number of options, which I will not click through here. Um, there's a ton of information in this, but you can see our full routing. Each of the waypoints is represented by one of those black squares. And up on the map after Chicago O'Hare, K-O-R-D, you can see some non-colored in empty squares leading out to KDTW. That is our alternate airport. If we were to divert for weather or some other reason, that would be the routing out there so we can brief it and prepare ourselves mentally ahead of time. Scrolling down, there is the paperwork preview. You can also pull this up in a PDF format or you could print it off if you want to kill some trees. It's usually anywhere from 30 to 50 pages but uh, you can actually get away with just printing about the first three to five if you like to have the paper. On here you can scroll through in this window or again go to the PDF to print it out and that is the actual briefing information that the flight crew would take with them on board and would use to brief themselves uh, and the rest of the crew on the planned flight. Scrolling down even further we have downloadable flight plans for the FMC and you can see all variety of payware and different uh, sim types are listed here if you scroll down to the very bottom you will find X-Plane 11 and there's the uh, default .fms file you could download this and then use the FMC to pull it up I'm not going to go through the procedures for that now and that would save you actually inputting the routing yourself on the FMC. Way down at the very bottom of the page we have a weather and notums. You can use click to show to get the weather briefings for each of those areas including the alternate. And then the very last thing at the bottom, pre-file on a network. If you're going to do some virtual air traffic control through Pilot Edge or VATSIM, you can click pre-file and it will send your data in to those ahead of time. Uh, it's not a feature I've actually used before. Alright, let's go into that briefing. I've pulled up the PDF and done some screenshots for us here. The important information on this briefing, uh, it's all useful and interesting, but not all of it's going to be necessary to get us off the ground. I'm going to assume you're probably using the Zebo model 737-800. When you program the FMC, and we have a tutorial on Flight Brothers if you need to see how to do that, you're going to want some information from this top right column, starting with CRZ SIS. That is our cost index. It says CI46. That's going to help uh, the FMC program our speeds for basically fuel economy. Uh, the higher the cost index number, the more fuel we're willing to burn. The lower the number, the more efficiently we want to sip our fuel and the slower we're going to end up flying. Next are some distances. We don't have to use those. The average wind, AVG wind, uh, 282 slash 050. You can put that into the FMC to help the wind calculations. Going down below that, just over this dotted line that breaks the page, over on the left you can see uh, ALTN for alternate, KDTW, that's uh, actually Detroit. Underneath that, FL steps, that's telling us what flight level we're flying at and any steps. Uh, we only have one flight level listed, 0350 stands for flight level 350 or 35,000 feet. 
we are going to be inputting that into the FMC. Moving on down, you can see we have sort of a chart area with a bunch of fuel data. Uh, let's just jump down to the last thing in the first four, FinRes. This is our reserve amount. It's typically pretty standard on here. It will be 2,308 pounds, which should last this aircraft about 30 minutes of flight. Scrolling down further, you can see a taxi fuel which is the estimated amount of fuel we would spend driving around the airport sitting and waiting. For example, if we were flying out of LaGuardia in real life, we might have an incredible amount of taxi fuel as the lineup and waiting with the engines running is typically quite long at LaGuardia. The block fuel, this is the number you really need, 28,739 pounds. Depending on the aircraft you're operating, you're going to be inputting that either on the weight, balance, and fuel page when you loaded the aircraft or from the menu. Under total fuel weight, you don't want to put it in one of the separate tanks. You'll have an imbalance. You'll just put it in total fuel weight. It will balance it for you. If you're using the flight factor or the Zebo, you can, and uh, particularly with the flight factor, you should load the fuel using the electronic flight bag the little fake iPad device in the cockpit. Alright, next, on page two of our briefing, it starts with the alternate routing. You can see a code here for KDTW, a runway, 09 left. Track would be the course we'd fly to get there. Distance, that's how far to get there. Here's our DCT direct again, and that's the routing to get you there. Moving down about halfway through this is the actual routing we're flying today. It's just restating it for us. Okay, SNA, departing runway 20 right. Our, uh, our SID, Pygmy 2, there's our full routing. And our arrival into Chicago at runway 04 left. The next block says departure ATC clearance. By this time this video comes out, we will have released an ATC departure tutorial. When you're talking to air traffic control, they know what you have planned, and when you request your clearance, you are going to madly scribble down what they tell you. If they say, as filed, you will be doing exactly that plan as was filed with them. If they read you a different clearance, you're going to need to scribble that down here because that is a legally binding clearance you have with air traffic control. Below that we have some weight items that uh, it's a little technical for what we're doing today. We're not going to worry about that. If you would like to see what your routing looks like, you can go to a website like Sky Vector, paste the routing in. Again, you can leave out DCT as it is completely unnecessary and it will all populate very nicely. I've zoomed in on just sort of the departure area. Next, the third page of the briefing. The top, we have uh, space to write in ATIS information. Underneath that, we have times and scheduling. On the right, there's blanked areas where you can put in the actual departure times for your logging purposes. Below that, we have weights. Uh, estimated passenger number, depending on the aircraft you're using, you might be inputting that, for example, on the flight factor aircraft. The payload weight, you will be using that on all the aircraft. If you go back to the weight and balance page, that goes up there at the top, 40.3 actually stands for 40,300 pounds. And then you can see our other weights. Uh, ZFW stands for zero fuel weight, the weight of the aircraft empty. The weight of the fuel, 28.7, stands for 28,700 pounds. And tow, T-O-W, is the takeoff weight for the aircraft. And below that we have some trim information where you would write in your estimated trim, but you really don't need that. From page four to the end is more than I really want to get into for the moment because you can, as long as you program the FMC correctly, largely ignore this, but this is really very useful information. 
in the real world, you would certainly not ignore it. But on the left, we have all of our waypoints, uh, including some special codes. Like down here, you can see TOC, that is top of climb. So when we finally arrive at our cruise altitude. Next thing, we have latitude, longitude for each of those points listed. And then we have uh, three pieces of information stacked up. We have flight level, the altitude at that waypoint. Uh, Mora is the um, minimum safe altitude, for, so if there's any obstacles, that's how high you need to be. I remember that correctly. Uh, distance is how far it's going to be to that waypoint from the previous. The next column, uh, you have our distance, which our DIS on the bottom there, which is the remaining distance to your destination. In the next column, you have uh, a decimal number, and this is more useful than most of the other ones here for you. That's going to be your actual airspeed as per briefing. You can see here we're going to be traveling most of the time at 0.78. That is a Mach number for Mach 0.78. That is pretty much the typical cruise speed for the Boeing 737-800. Uh, we have our estimated winds after that. In the next column, we have air temperature calculations in the following column. And then in the last two are fuel. EFOB stands for estimated fuel on board. And there's dots for you to write the AFOB, the actual fuel on board at that waypoint. And the last column is telling you uh, how much fuel should have been burnt at that point. And then you can put down the actual burnt fuel at that point. A lot of that you can, again, ignore if you've programmed everything correctly. You don't really have to refer to that if everything is going well in flight. On the uh, last page of this briefing, we have TOD listed. That's top of descent. Um, we have a descent arrival FMC video as well. You do need to readjust your altitude before you hit that for the VNAV to successfully begin sending the aircraft at the appropriate time to get you down to the correct altitude uh, for your airport at the right time. All right, so we've got a lot of resources we have pulled together here. I hope that you feel confident now in how you can identify a real-world flight, what information from that flight you will need. I hope you have seen how you would input that into SimBrief and the most basic information you would need from SimBrief. Again, if you need further help, we have a video on how to program the FMC. We have a video on how to start up the Zebo. We have a video on how to descend using the Zebo FMC for arrival. And if there's anything else you can think of that we don't have a video for, please leave us a comment or contact us on YouTube or on Facebook. We love to hear from our viewers. And again, many of these videos are actually the result of your requests. So thank you for watching Flight Brothers FT. Plan the flight and fly the plan.